right. So, uh, okay. So today we're, we start, uh, we're starting a new study in uh, the epistle to Titus from the apostle Paul. And I have uh, subtitled this, the mouths that must be stopped. Now this is quite different uh, than what one reads when they look at uh, scholarship, modern Protestant scholarship. They're uh, the focus about what they think, both actually in Titus and Timothy, has more to do with church order, and they call it church order as opposed to um, the order of the elders, the bishops and elders. Uh, Paul addresses both Timothy and Titus, Titus with very severe concern about what the elders are doing and, and their qualifications. And, and this comes out fairly strong. It's not the church, it's the leadership in the church that, that Paul is pointing to as being the issue for him. So this is my subtitle, The Mouths That Must Be Stopped. And my theme is about things that are wanting. And I'm going to elaborate on that in a bit. Things that are wanting. And this is also at a time when, when Paul writes, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. So this is what, uh, what we take from, uh, from even just the, the first chapter. This, all of this comes spilling out. So we're going to spend a little bit of time now in an introduction, and you'll get uh, most of what I have to say about, uh, about Titus in the introductory slides. I have a number of slides that will characterize what I think information is available about Titus. So Paul is thought to have written to Titus in about 64 AD, so very close towards the end of his ministry. And uh, Paul had gone to Macedonia uh, about that time, writing first to Timothy and then to Titus from Macedonia. 1 Timothy 1 3, Vivian. Titus. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. 1 it's Timothy. Titus. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So <clears throat> Paul's in Macedonia. He's writing. Paul had earlier visited Crete. And that was about in 63 AD. And he left Titus there. And we in Titus 1 5. So this is now in the uh, epistle of Titus, chapter 1, verse 5. You have just the phrase, for this cause left I thee in Crete. And we're going to see what the cause is uh, shortly. Now, get into some of the details that we can discover about Titus. Titus was an uncircumcised Greek. And we know that from Galatians 2.3. Galatians 2.3, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Titus accompanied Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem for contact with the elders. That is, them which were of reputation, who debated with the three, that is, Paul, uh, Barnabas, and Titus. The elders there in Jerusalem had a debate with the three concerning the gospel which Paul preached among the Gentiles. And then from Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Galatians 2, 1 and 2. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me, all, uh, sorry, with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Now just note that had Titus been an ethnic Greek Gentile of the nations, he would have been ignorant of both the Hebrew language and the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, Greeks don't go around learning Hebrew and studying the Hebrew 
uh, scriptures. In fact, they don't even have access to the, the, the Hebrew scriptures, which essentially they're just their rolls, scrolls, and they're kept in the synagogues. So it's not like you just flip open your Bible and, and study things. You've got to go to the synagogue, and you have to be able to speak the language. So thus, he would have been of no knowledgeable assistance to Paul if he had been a Greek Gentile of the nations. He would have been a know-nothing. And then Paul writes that he had this meeting with the um, those of reputation in Jews Jerusalem privately, uh, lest by any means should I run or had run in vain. And this was what we looked at last Sunday, where Paul knew that if the multitude, that is the multitude of Jews in Jerusalem, and the, uh, had known, had heard that Paul, what Paul was preaching to the Gentiles, they could try and stop him because they weren't in favor of these things that Paul was teaching. And as a result, his run would be in vain or would be you know, futile. So Paul met with the elders privately so that he wouldn't run into the opposition of those in Jerusalem who still wanted to kill him. Okay, that Titus was Hebrew is set clear by the elders in Jerusalem, allowing him, that is allowing Titus in company with Paul and Barnabas. So Titus is Greek only by nationality and culture. Now we we'll look at uh, we'll look at Galatians two six to pick up some information here. Galatians two six, but of these who seem to be somewhat. And that word somewhat uh, speaks of some, a person of note or importance. So when you see the word somewhat. The Oxford uh, English Dictionary says, somewhat is a person of importance. But these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. So had Titus been a Gentile of the nations, there would have been no value in his being with Paul because it was... Paul, who was the authority, so Paul is the one who received the revelation of, uh, of Christ, and he spoke of sound doctrine. And unless somebody knew the scriptures, there's no way that they could work with Paul. They would have to know, one would have to know the Hebrew scriptures, as did Barnabas, because Par Barnabas didn't have the revelation that was given to Paul. But Barnabas knew the scriptures, as Titus knew the scriptures. So that way, they can be of assist with Paul. Now, Titus was a comfort to Paul. Second uh, Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 5. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. Nevertheless, God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. So Titus had begun and would finish the work of grace in others of the call to be saints. And this is interesting, that Titus could actually begin a work and then would finish a work. So this speaks of his uh, abilities, his capabilities, his knowledgeability of these matters, that he could begin something and carry it through to the finish. A note in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. So that's the work that is being finished in you, in them. Therefore, 
As he had bound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Okay, so this is the work that Timothy had, uh, Titus rather, had begun and would finish. So Paul could expect this of, uh, of the Corinthian saints in that Titus had finished in them the same grace. So it wasn't Paul who had finished in them. It was Titus who had finished in them this work, this work of grace. So Titus shared Paul's earnest care for the Corinthians, and we know. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. So, th th so there it is stated in, in Paul's own words that Titus had the same earnest care. And that was now for the Corinthians. He had done a work in them, and he was concerned for them. Now, Paul called Titus, and this is significant, I, I might think about this, that Paul called Titus a partner and a fellow helper. Uh, those are very lofty terms for the apostle of and to the Gentiles to consider anybody a partner as well as a fellow helper. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. So I note here then that for one to be at this level with Paul, that is to be a partner and a fellow helper with Paul, Paul the Apostle, would require one to be knowledgeable, in fact, very knowledgeable of the Hebrew scriptures. And in order to be very knowledgeable of the Hebrew scriptures, thus a Hebrew. The only help a Gentile of the nations might provide Paul would be to carry his bags. So I, I could not rise to this level. In fact, I don't know that we know anybody in ministry in the world today that could contribute to Paul to the extent that Paul would consider them a partner as well as a fellow helper. So this is very significant. I could carry Paul's bags, pick them up, put them down, but that's about it. All Anything that I know is only because I've read Paul. Okay, then moving on. So Titus, as was Paul's pattern, did not burden others with charges for his ministering to them. And this is, this is significant as well. And, and, I, and I see it as something worthy of note. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? So it, this is important because especially now when we get into uh, the epistle to Titus, Paul's uh, letter to Titus, he, he's, uh, Paul is going to speak to Titus about filthy lucre. And uh, which uh, I'll just say now is like, it's really, it's sort of money under the table. And, and uh, Titus was, uh, had nothing to do with that. Titus, when Paul said, did Titus make a gain of you? Did he, did, he, Paul is pointing out that Titus did not go around sticking his hand out and saying, well, I've done this for you. What are you going to do for me? Uh, Titus did not do that. And Paul could speak to him in, in a way in his letter, which we'll see where Paul speaks about those, the leadership in, uh, in Crete that were, had their hand out uh, trying to make gain of the, of the people there. 
I have a question, Brother Van. Yes. Um, in that um, reference in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul mentions another brother by, by not naming him. Is he talking about Titus, actually, or is there a third person? It's not stated. It's not. Yeah. I, it, your not guess would be as good as mine. He's already mentioned Titus. Yeah. So it could oh. be somebody other than Titus. Yeah. So he's not sort of just using a third person to refer to Titus also. You know, I, I'll be honest, I didn't really sort of plumb that, Phil, to see if I could figure that out. But uh, I don't, yeah, I really don't know. I just, I, I went on the notion that not stated, we don't know who the person is. Well, it's pretty clear about Titus. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And one last thing, in Acts 14, it talks about the Greeks and the Jews believing, after, you know, in, in, uh, after hearing Paul. Yes. Is, uh, would that be where Titus, or Titus would be in that group of Greeks, not oh. Jews? Yeah, of that that Greek. So, so we're you've got. That. We're going to cover that, oh. and in, in the extent you know, we, we remember that it is not it is unlawful for one that is a Jew to keep company with uh, a Gentile of the nations. It, or an uncircumcised. Uh, or one that is uncircumcised. So, yeah. So there there are issues there. We don't realize those issues as much today anymore as as uh, was true at this time. Today, things are much more relaxed. Uh, Jews and, and Gentiles uh, mix much more freely. Although I, I can say I do recall from, uh, from time when I was in business um, that there were limits as to how those uh, that I knew that were Jewish, how far they would go in socializing with me. They, were, they would sort of draw the line as to how far they would go with me. And there were certain things they would preclude me from, um, from, from doing with them because they were Jewish and they needed to maintain a little distance, which I think for most part, many people misunderstand. But I understand it as being this is part of the rigor that is uh, incorporate in being a Jew. And how it was stated in Leviticus chapter 20, yeah. uh, verses 24 and 26, that God had separated them from all other people and they would be his, and alone yes. they yeah. would be his. Now, attitudes today are, are changed and there's a wider range of mentalities amongst Hebrews there are Jews that are very conservative, uh, very strict and orthodox in their practice, but then there are also Jews who are extremely liberal and, uh, and, and not so rigorous in those things that are in scripture. So it's, it, it's not, it's not uh, easy to sort of summarize and say, well, what was going on? Because it is so different today. And, and there are so many different attitudes today amongst, amongst Hebrew folks. Okay, then Titus went to Dalmatia after the work in Crete. And, and I'll say that Dalmatia, um, which we'll see in a map in a bit, Dalmatia incorporates um, what is a larger region which incorporates what, uh, that which includes the uh, country of, of Croatia. So Titus was in, the, in, in an area which today we know as, uh, as Croatia and, and, uh, and surrounding area. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So there goes Titus into Dalmatia, and he's taking the gospel of the grace of God with him there to, uh, to the uncircumcised there in Dalmatia. Okay, so that is the conclusion of my introduction. And uh, my objective was to get to a, a little bit more information about Titus because it's true that it's, it doesn't fall out of scripture easily. You have to do a little work to sort of find it and pull it together. And uh, hopefully that gives you a little better sense of who Titus was. And my summary thought is that Titus is a, a very capable 
man in terms of knowledge and, and abilities, uh, knowledge of the scriptures and ability to present and to lead. He was a very good leader. All right, so now we're into chapter one, Titus chapter one. Titus chapter one, beginning at verse one. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the, the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. So we start off here, verse 1, Paul, a servant of God according to the faith of God's elect. So I know that God speaking through the prophet Isaiah writes, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So, uh, so the, the prophet Isaiah is writing to the Hebrews. He's not writing to the Gentiles of the nations. Uh, although replacement theology will say that, no, this now comes to us. But no, that would, that's a stretch. That's taking scripture now and, and twisting it to one's own purposes because the prophet says of God that ye Israel are my witnesses saith the Lord that's Jehovah God speaking and so you're my witnesses and you're my servant and I have chosen so this all this matter of election uh, is not whether or not I have been elected to be saved or not elected to be saved this whole matter of being chosen and elected is God's work in choosing his witness, his servant, who is Israel. And he, he says, I have chosen, and then there's a colon. Now this explains, so the colon says that there's an explanation now that follows as to the purpose of this being chosen. Why witnesses, why servant? You're chosen for this purpose, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. So there's God's purposes with Israel, his witnesses, his servant, that they may know, believe, and understand who Jehovah God is. So Israel is chosen as stated for the purposes that are stated. Now, and this is, and also I'll say, it, you notice here, it's not a matter here of choosing them to be saved. They're not chosen to be saved. They're chosen to be witnesses and servants. Salvation for Israel comes with enduring, that they have to maintain their function as a witness, as a servant, without failing, without denying him. That's where, how there's, and following him, that's how their salvation comes. So, so then Paul writes, the faith of God's elect, the faith of God's elect. So John 14, 1. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. So this is, the, this is when we say the faith, that is, what do they believe? The faith of God's elect. And this is interesting. Way back here, John chapter 14 Jesus is saying to his disciples, ye believe in God. See, they, they already believed God. That wasn't the issue. The issue was whether or not they believed that Christ was who he said he was. But the point is, the faith of God's elect is that they believed in God. Then, 
of Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Now I'm going to pause before we go to verse 4. So now Paul then asks the question, almost as if to, to in anticipation of replacement theology, what if some did not believe? Does that then make the faith of God, does that mean that they need to be replaced? Paul says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Okay, so there we have Paul's guidance here, uh, his, his knowledge of what God had intended. So the faith of God's elect is that it's the Hebrew who first came to knowledge of God as a nation, as a people, and they are God's elect. And then, brother Paul's, man, yeah. One quick thought. Yeah. Um, Jesus Christ is also God's elect, right? Yes. And yeah. The faith that we can, and uh, say we're saved by uh, we're, uh, uh, we're we're saved by grace. It's the faith of Christ. Yes. yes. Right. So yeah. an, an, another way to to, uh, to to look at the this 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 passage could be that uh, the the faith of Christ, according to the faith of Christ. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There is well. A, definitely connected. Yes. To your point. And then Paul says, acknowledging of the truth, the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Now, this is a uh, this matter of acknowledging the truth. We uh, we know this from what Paul has written during this dispensation of the grace of God in First Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, very handy to know. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So this is a theme uh, of Paul's concern. Salvation is a matter, and then coming to the knowledge of truth is a subsequent matter. And Paul speaks of this then to, to Titus. He talks, talks of acknowledging of the truth. So there's a consistent, there's a very consistent theme through what Paul has to say really to everyone to whom he's, he's writing. Okay, so we will move on. And then Paul says, which is after godliness. And then this now points to the mystery of godliness. And so, which is after godliness, 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, the reason that this is without controversy becomes apparent when we, when we understand that these Hebrews, these uncircumcised Hebrews, had not seen the risen Christ. All they had to go on was Paul's testimony. And so Paul acknowledges at the beginning of 1 Timothy 3.16, he goes that this is a great, this is, in other words, a fantastic, a wonderful, but it is a mystery of godliness. And the mystery being that they believed God was manifest in the flesh. Now, this is something that, uh, um, Thomas had difficulty with because Thomas was not going to believe until he saw the risen Christ. The wounds. the wounds. He wanted to see the wounds. He wanted to touch the wounds. He wanted to see uh, the wounds. And so we have now these Hebrews who are believing just based on the words of Paul. So they believe God was manifest in the flesh. And then they were justified in the spirit. They were seen of angels. That is that they were, they were uh, an exhibit before the angels. These Hebrews now who have come to faith in God now are being observed by the angels. These then did preach unto the Gentiles. And this would be, include the Gentiles of the nations. 
So thankfully, we now have those that are spreading the word to Gentiles of the nations. Their preaching then was believed on in the world. And then as a reward, they will be received up into glory and they'll be, they'll be judged for their work and they'll be rewarded accordingly for their service because they are the servants and they are the witnesses. Brother Van? Yes. Uh, quick thought, um, without controversy, um, that uh, meaning there's no controversy among the apostles. Without controversy, great like the mystery. Like so they're all in agreement with each other. Uh, uh, perhaps okay. a little. I, I take it this way, David. Yeah. That it's without controversy because it's like that's they all agree that it's amazing that they would believe these things. Mm -hmm. That's the, the controversy would be. Uh, if there was no controversy, then it's natural for the uncircumcised to believe that Christ was God come in the flesh. That was something that Thomas had difficulty with. So that these uncircumcised would believe it just based on Paul's testimony would be an amazing, so that would be, that would be where there's no controversy. That in itself is a an amazing uh, realization. So without controversy, there's, there was no disagreement that it's amazing that they believe these things. That they would become godly. That, that, the they, that, they, that the uncircumcised would become godly. And then that godly being that all these things then, this is actually their, kind of like their statement of faith. This is what they, what was true of them. Okay, then moving on to verse two, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie had promised before the world began. Now this word, when we see the word hope, hope of eternal life, this is something that is peculiar and unique to the body over which Christ is head. Because Job, in Job chapter 6, verse 11. Job 6, verse 11. What is my strength that I should hope? And what is mine end that I should prolong my life? So Job acknowledges here, he has no knowledge of where there should be hope. He says, what is my strength? He says, what is there to hope? And why should, why should I prolong my life? What am I looking for that I'm going to hope for something? Then Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 19 and 20. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Ah, so now we see the character of hope. So if Christ is still, if, if he did not raise from the dead, there is no hope. And that's what Paul, the point Paul is making. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, but he says that Christ is risen. And this was what Paul, and when we look at uh, the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul talks about, unless you have believed in vain. And that believing in vain was the persistent controversy, or actually the teaching of, of certain Sadducees, that there is no resurrection from the dead. And that, um, that teaching was still around in Paul's time and persistent that there is no resurrection. That's why Paul speaks about belief in vain. Christ is risen and become the first fruits of them. So this hope is the hope of resurrection, which Job did not have knowledge of. So Paul writes then in first, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, the hope of eternal life. This all points to what's true for the body of Christ. And this eternal life is something that was promised before the world began. Now, I know it's promised before the world began, not before the earth began. 
It was promised before the world began, before the, the system of the world began, the promise was made. First John 2.25. First John chapter 2, verse 25. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. And John chapter 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So it was in Christ, both for um, the kingdom saints and for the body over which Christ is head, that life is in Christ. That's common to both Gospels, both the Gospel of the, of the Kingdom and the Gospel of Grace. Uh, Brother Van? Yeah. Uh, it sounds like when you use the word system instead of earth, uh, we're talking about Genesis 3.15, because uh, the seed of the woman was promised then before you know, all the world systems got into motion, right? Yes, that, that's true. And it's, you know, it, it, you, you raise a good point and it's hard for me to, you know, to somehow make a case for what world Paul is speaking to when he's talked about before the world began. Um, but I'm thinking that it would be the world since Christ, the system into which Christ entered. But, you know, I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. And you raise a good point. I mean, I've heard many interpretations on this one. You know, promised before, promised to whom? If, if it, before the world began, it, it would have been God promising among himself between, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, yeah, 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 I yeah. think so. Yeah, true. And then uh, what about the promise for the society that was before the flood? So, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's very difficult to lay down anything firm on that, but it is something that did happen um, not before the earth began, but before the world began, as Paul states it. And in your quote where, where Jesus says eternal life, and they're pointing to me, you know, yes. we're talking about someone that Job knew he couldn't save himself from that scripture you quoted. Yes. Yeah, someone had to. He couldn't figure out his end and, and prolong it, but somebody, a day's man, someone to come in between. Exactly. Uh, that's that's very, very true. Good. Very good point. I think that's Job chapter nine, where, 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 where Job speaks about there's no, no mediator to come between me and God. A day's man. A day's man. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and to uh, arbitrate between the two of us. So there was, there was, uh, but then, you know, as, as, uh, as scripture says, they searched the scriptures. John writes, you script the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And then he points to himself. They are they which testify of me. So it was, they needed to come to the realization that this eternal life is in Christ. Amen. Hey, Brother Van? Yeah. Um, what you just said there uh, uh, earlier just, uh, I, I think, made a light bulb go off. Um, I shared a couple verses uh, in, uh, in the chat there about, yes. uh, um, by faith Noah being warned of God of things not yet, as not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world. Uh, ah, yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. And became yes. heir of the righteousness, which is of by which is by faith. And then second Peter two, five and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So mm -hmm. there was a world before the flood and a world after the flood. Yes. Yes. So, um, so um, when, when you made, when you made that shared that thought, um, is uh, do you think this is like a um promise before the world began as in like uh the the the, the world after the flood began yeah i know yeah yeah I, <laughs> so good. Uh, yeah i know awesome. well that's a <laughs> yeah, you know, okay. it, it, it's a it's a good question and i think that's, uh, that's a that's a study in itself <laughs> yeah i know yeah, yeah 
as one Gentile of the nation speaking to another Gentile of the nations, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> it was a good, very good. <laughs> but I, mean, yeah, well, I think that was that was a very good little bit of research you did there. <laughs> well done. Okay. So then <clears throat> we have here in verse three, but hath in due times, in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me to the commandment of God, our Savior. So we're going to focus a little bit here on this matter of due times. Romans 5, 6. Romans 5, 6. <clears throat> for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So, so it's interesting, you know, God is very precise in when he does things. And he does things according to due time. I mean, we don't necessarily think of God checking his watch and checking the calendar and saying, all right, it's time for this, but evidently. And then we have 1 Corinthians 15, 8. 1 Corinthians 15, 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Now, this is interesting. And I, I share was sharing this with Vivian. We had a little bit of a discussion on this. But my thought being that Paul was the last one to be born again. He was, he was, in fact, born out of due time. So John 3, 3. John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this matter of being born again is very Hebrew. I mean, it points to Israel. Although I'm not going to, I'm not going to belabor it with a with a brother in Christ who thinks they're born again. That's fine. Uh, it's not something to 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 try and twist somebody's arm over. But it, but if I'd like to know exactly what this is pointing to, uh, it does point to. Israel, it points to the Hebrew, as we're going to see now. And I, and I point now that Paul was the last one at, at, coming into this dispensation of the grace of God that was actually born again, because he says he was born out of due time. So he said, well, what, what's this out of due time stuff? So here we take a look at um, a picture of Israel where the prophet Hosea writes. Now, this is Hosea, the prophet, writing about Israel, and he's he's writing up, it, and it's a it's a picture from Hosea of Israel, and he says in Hosea two three. Hosea two three, lest I strip her naked and set her in the day she was that she was born, and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. So this is uh, uh, the prophet uh, writing about his, the wife that he had taken from whoredom, and that he talks about now that she is a picture, this a picture of this wife that Hosea had, and the relationship with the prophet was analogous to the relationship between Israel and God. I mean, Israel, well, Israel was not very faithful as Hosea's wife wasn't very faithful. So in the day that she was born, so that points to Israel. So Israel, the nation, was born the first time in, in the wilderness. When they came out of Egypt, and God says, I bear thee on eagles' wings, it was there in the wilderness that they became identified as a people and a nation. Israel, my firstborn. My firstborn, yeah. And then and we look at, we continue on now uh, in uh, first, first Timothy 2, 6, and we're still focused on this matter of due time. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Okay, so now due time, a ransom for all. Matthew 20. Matthew 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, 
and to give his life a ransom for many. All right, so here we have in Matthew a matter of a ransom for many, but then Paul speaks about a ransom for all in due time. So the question is, how did the ransom extend from for many to for all? And first, it was the inclusion of all Hebrews, and then by them for us. So there were Hebrews that came to faith, not all of them, but many of them came to faith. Not all of Israel believed, but many did come. And so then that ransom is for those that believe. But then in due time, following the work of these Hebrews, then it came to us. So then the ransom now is a, Paul now speaks of a ransom for all. And during this dispensation of the grace of God, salvation, that ransom that was paid, is now extended to all on the earth. And it matters not who the individual is, whether a Hebrew or other Gentile of the nations, the, the salvation is available to all. This was not true before the dispensation of the grace of God. So, Brother Van, yeah. very transitional, because when uh, Stephen was stoned uh, to death, that was a rejection of the authority of Israel, of the Jews, right? The, their authority of the, over the, at the temple. And after that, you saw a lot of evangelization of the Samaritans, right? Like there were, yes. right in Acts chapter 8, you see yeah. uh, Philip going and, and, uh, and you see them believing. And these were not Jews. So it kept on going. And then, right, and then it, 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 uh, it, it kept expanding from many to all. Yes. And, and, and indeed, yeah, and indeed, the stoning of Stephen uh, punctuated the nation refusing Christ as their Messiah. So that was that was the nation itself now saying under the authority of the leaders of Israel that we will not have this man to be over us. And, and, and even though they had the extension of mercy and the additional time, they said, no, we're not having it. So then it went out to others. Okay, I was just wondering whether you see it as transitional or sort of sudden. sudden. Oh, um, whether I see it as transitional or... You know, or, from the ransom for many to the ransom for all. Yeah, it, so it in fact was moving towards the mystery, but at this point, until, until Paul is saved, it is still a matter for salvation amongst the many. But then the moment Paul becomes saved and gets the revelation from Christ, then there is now something new is on the scene. And I see that as, I guess I'll use the word, it's an abrupt uh, change in what was happening. Something new happened. And in fact, much of Israel, much of many of the Jews in Jerusalem had difficulty with what was being said because it wasn't consistent with what they, they had known of the scriptures and expected all to come under. They expected all to come under the kingdom gospel. And now Paul is preaching something which is entirely, entirely different. It doesn't, it doesn't feel the same in any way at all. So Paul says to Timothy, he says, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified and to be, and testified means to simply to bear witness, to give proof, um, to affirm the truth of a statement. So this, this matter of being a ransom for all was to be Bared out is true, proven true, in due time. 
So I know that Jesus came as a ransom for all of Israel. That would be testified in due time. Now, this is a little perplexing because it would say, well, how can all of Israel be saved? It, all of Israel will be saved, but it's going to follow the purging. So those after the purging, what is left is, in fact, that will be Israel. And they will all be saved. That is where the ransom accrues to the purged, uh, the purified Israel, and all of them will be saved. And that's what uh, is coming out in truth. Psalm uh, 68, 18, and we're pointing here to this matter of who are the captives? Psalm 68, 18, thou hast descended on high, Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. And then Isaiah 49, 24. Isaiah 49, 24. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? So the point being here, this ransom for all, that a ransom needs to be paid because it is... Israel, the Hebrew, that is pointed to as being captive. And not only are they captive, but they are legally captive. So the mighty, which points to Satan, the devil, he actually is in a legal position with his captivity of Israel. And in order for Christ to be able to win them back, a ransom needs to be paid. And, and this is what was done. A ransom was paid, which then allowed Christ to lead captivity. Those that were captured, he was able to take them back, and they became now, they become the captive of God. So the prey has been defeated, the or rather the mighty has been defeated, and the prey, which is Israel, is now taken back as uh, owned by God. And that's this matter of then a ransom for all. And this is promised before, but hath in, but hath in due times manifested his word. So even though it was promised before, now it is clearly revealed. That is to make plainly evident to the understanding. And Paul writes to T Titus, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now notice this word committed. So something is committed to Paul. Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So here's Paul's unique position with this gospel. It is committed. It was committed to him. So he's the one on the, uh, on the earth, in the world, who had this responsibility. And he says, according to the commandment of God our Savior. And in Acts, we read... Acts 13, verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation to the ends of the earth. So now the, the, this commandment then, which starts with Paul, now goes to us, not us being Gentiles of the nations, because it's going to go out to the Gentiles that salvation then would extend to the ends of the earth. So this is true now of this present dispensation that salvation is available to the ends of the earth, not just the world, but of the whole. So it, it matters not what system we come across on the earth. Salvation is available to all. And then to Timothy. First Timothy chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, 
and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Again, the, the, the commandment, the, the, the commanding nature of this responsibility to Paul. And then finding out in verse 4, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. So he writes, he says to, Tim, to Titus, mine own son after the common faith. Now, common means belonging to more than one. So it's free to be used by everyone. This faith is a faith that is available. It belongs to more. It belongs to everyone who will take it. He says, grace. Now, I'm going to compare this to Timothy because Paul wrote to Timothy. He also said, grace, mercy, and peace. Now, so compared to Timothy, grace in that Titus was first a Gentile of the nations, a people not under law. So a people not under law are candidates for grace. But then he says, mercy. Titus was also a Hebrew. The Hebrews are a people under law. And as a lawbreaker, and Titus being uncircumcised would be a breaker of that covenant, that which God had, uh, uh, the edict of God as to regarding circumcision, the lawbreaker is in need of mercy. That is, that they are spared the punishment that would come with breaking the law. So then having received both grace and mercy, then Colossians 3.15. Uh, which speaks of peace. Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. So Paul writes grace, mercy, and as a result, peace. Now, this is unique to those uncircumcised Hebrews. Today, I, as a Gentile of the nation, I, I, all I need is just the grace of God. I don't need the mercy of God because I'm not under law, never have been under the law of God. I'm not a, I'm not a breaker of God's law because I've never been under God's law. But if God doesn't extend mercy to me, then I'm without hope. And he has done this. Okay, so now we're going to move into verses 5 to 9. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. Titus 1, starting at verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the stewards of, steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So before I move on, just to notice what is coming out of these verses, the focus of what Paul has to say is not on the church. It's on the leadership. The leaders are the issue here. Paul has an issue with the leaders. There are things that are wanting. He doesn't say the church is wanting. He says the leaders, the, these leaders are wanting. Now, he says, for this cause left I thee in Crete. So I know it's not Cyprus. I mean, right away we think, oh, uh, is that Cyprus? No, it's not Cyprus. It's Crete. So I go, well, where's, where is Crete? Okay, so here's a map. And there's Crete. All right, and there's Cyprus. So Paul went to Cyprus. Um, 
but he didn't really spend much time in Crete. So Crete's way over here is really part of uh, part of Greece. And here's another map. You can see where Crete is. You find Cyprus, and then here are all the all the church fellowships that Paul went to in the uh, in Colossae, Ephesus, Corinth, Thessalonica, Philippi. So Paul was all through these areas here, and Titus was down here in Crete. And he was in Corinth. Yeah, he was. In, yeah. Okay, and then Paul did also go by Crete on his way to Rome. And we have a passage here, which we'll look at. This is another map. Now this just focuses in on, on Crete itself and the, the, uh, some of the cities or townships that are on Crete, uh, Salmon, um, there is uh, the Fair Havens, La Silla, uh, Phoenix, which uh, Fennis is actually at the time it was called Fennis when, uh, and Vivian will read now this passage. And this is Paul speaking of a time when he was uh, on his way by boat uh, to Rome. It's actually Luke's account. Uh, Luke Luke's is, account, yeah, Luke, Luke is writing it, yes. Acts 27, we'll read verses seven and eight, and then verse 12. We sailed under Crete over against Salmon, and hardly passing it, we came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Verse 12. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phinis, and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the south. Okay, so Paul actually so then went southwest and southwest. northwest. Yes, yeah, southwest and northwest. Okay. <laughs> yes. So these are these are places, and Paul spent a little bit of time here. He wintered actually uh, in uh, Venice, uh, and they didn't they didn't um, they didn't winter in the Fair Havens. He says there that uh, the Fair Havens wasn't a good place to winter, but Venice was a good place to winter. So Paul went past all these places. So this is this is how uh, uh, Crete is uh, remembered in Scripture. So for this cause, back now to Titus ver chapter one verse five, for this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. So Paul instructs Titus on matters to be set in order, being there were things that were out of order. So he says there are, there are things that need to be set in order. And why? Because they're out of order. Second point, things that were wanting. So things that are wanting are things that are inadequate. So this, this is, these are the orders now that Titus has from Paul concerning what needs to happen in Crete. So something yet wanting is that which is not yet perfect. The things that are wanting, they're not perfect yet. So Paul says the word order, that thou should have set in order and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So this is the order, there needs to be order, and it, it's focused on elders, not the church. It's focused on elders. So Paul instructs Titus, as I had appointed thee, it appears the current order was out of order. But what criteria had Paul appointed Titus to handle the matter of ordaining elders? So he's Paul, Titus has been appointed. So what are what's the criteria? What's the way that Paul uh, Titus is to look for and find elders to do the task? And so he writes here as we continue now in verse five b into six, as I had appointed thee, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children not accused of right or unruly. 
So note, for one to be an elder, they had to be blameless. That's, that's a pretty tall order, but Paul expected this of the elders. And blameless means simply that. They, they couldn't be something that they could be faulted over. Number two, married. They had to be married and married with one wife, only one wife. Three, they had to have they had to have believing children. Notice this. They had to have faithful, that's believing children that were not accused of riot or unruly. That is that the children had to be well behaved in every regard. So this is this is a pretty tall order. I don't know that we expect this of anybody today to be blameless, married with one wife only, and have children that are well behaved. That is no, no unruliness, no, no going out and partying until wee hours of the morning, coming home intoxicated. So evidently, there were elders in Crete that did not meet this criteria. And as such, things that are wanting, there were things that were wanting. That's what Paul says. Then he goes on. Now we're looking at uh, verses leading up to verse 9. And he says, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So we'll be able to get a little bit more done here before we run out of time. Uh, so he says, for a bishop must be blameless. So the elder, the elder here is a bishop. And here's the list. Must be blameless. Must be not self-willed, that is, the elder is not to be single-minded. He's not to be, not to treat the body as his little fiefdom, where it's my way or the highway. Not self-willed. Three, not soon angry. In other words, couldn't have a temper. Not allowed to fly off the handle. He had to be somebody that would be, was composed and could handle uh, lots of different input. So not soon angry. Not given to wine. That is not a drunkard. And then we have this matter, no striker. So we say, well, what's, what's a striker? Well, a striker, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, a striker is one who roams, uh, one who's a vagrant. That would be somebody who's not dependable because they're roaming around. So a striker, they couldn't be a striker. They had to be dependably there, not roaming around, not disappearing. Then number six, not given to filthy lucre. That is dishonorable gain. Now remember, Timothy or Titus was one that did not make gain. Of, of those that he ministered to, uh, there was nothing under the table. Uh, and so Paul speaks to Titus and says that the elder, a bishop, is not to be one who is going, who's after filthy lucre, that is getting money paid to him on the side. And that matter of actually this, this word, these words, filthy lucre, uh, as a, a two-word statement shows up in the Oxford English Dictionary, and it actually is defined as dishonorable gain. Filthy lucre is dishonorable gain. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. So further, a bishop must be 
a lover of hospitality that is warm and welcoming. The bishop must be warm and welcoming. A lover of good men knows how to keep good company, keeps good company. Sober. Now we think today sober means just beverage. No, sober is moderate in both food and drink. So not a glutton for food and neither a drunkard. Is that OED? Uh, that's OED, yes. I should have put that in there. That is OED. Sober is moderate in both food and drink. Hey, Brother Van? Yeah. Quick thought. Uh, I looked up striker in Oxford English Dictionary. Yes. And, and uh, while you're talking, and what one of the other definitions, and just like uh, another facet maybe, right? Was yeah. somebody who protests. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like a like yeah. a protester. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a yeah. more modern. That is that's yeah. the, the more modern understanding of a striker is uh, someone who goes on strike or somebody in a baseball game who strikes out. Yeah, but when you think like. Yeah. It, but even 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 uh, even just that thought, just like it's not appropriate for somebody who's who's uh you know who's committed to um a position of leadership yeah in, in a position of leadership to be uh to be uh protesting worldly issues yeah yeah, yeah. And, and that's and actually that's a very good point mm -hmm. uh <clears throat> we should stick to scripture we should not involve ourselves in in world issues and and polarize around uh, around matters to strike over yeah. This word, uh, then there's the word just. So sober and then just. Now, just, not speaking of justice, but we say actually just points to exact and accurate. So we say, we'll say things like just now, which means exactly now, or just in time means exactly in time. So the word just, interesting, is that which is exact and accurate. So the, the bishop had to be exact and accurate with what they were saying. Then this matter of holy. Now, holy, uh, as defined also in the Oxford English Dictionary, is set apart as commissioned. So not holy in the sense of being sinless, because all men are sinners, but they are to be they they are to be set apart that is they are to hold themselves apart as they are commissioned to do a work and then finally temperate which is from the oxford diction dictionary temperate is self-restrained and moderate so this is a very tall order and i dare say i don't i don't measure up to this at all and I don't know anybody today that can do this, but this is what Paul expected. And this, these were the instructions that he gave to, to Titus. And then he says that the bishop then has to hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine. Notice this, by sound doctrine, you see, he's been taught to both exhort now, the exhort is to warn earnestly. Exhorting is to warn someone and then to convince the gainsayers. So the bishop was actually to engage and to warn those and to convince them who wanted to the gainsayers. And as a gainsayer is one who speaks against, one who opposes, and one who denies. Can I just make a point? Yeah. This is talking about uh, the situation in Crete. Yeah. And uh, um, Paul is instructing Titus uh, how he's to administer these things to the bishops and holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Well, Paul never taught these bishops. So yeah. they had to be taught by Titus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then from Titus, they were going to exhort and convince the gainsayers mm -hmm. who were underneath the bishops. Yeah, very good point. It's a, it's a 
they, a, a hierarchy. They, yeah. So the, there is very much there. There is a hierarchy of command here, which then underscores that they really there they are there are soldiers, and they're expected to perform and obey under command. Okay, so we've hit the top of the hour. We'll 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 park it here, and we'll pick up uh, next time at uh, at verse ten. So we in Titus chapter one, verse ten, continuing on.